Welcome to the broadcast of the Bethel United Reformed Church. You can visit us online at jenisonbethel.org. Or you can join us each Sunday on the corner of 20th and Baldwin in Jenison. Our service times are 9.30 a.m. and 5.20 p.m. If you'd like a copy of this message, you can download it and many more by going to sermonaudio.com and searching for Bethel Jenison. Or you can re-watch this service and others by going to YouTube and searching for Bethel Jenison. As we now turn our attention to the worship of God, may the Lord richly bless you, that you may know the comfort and the peace of belonging to the Lord. Hear now the law of the Lord our God, as it is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, 
You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And we hear these words from Hebrews chapter 4. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. We focused on this uh, last Sunday morning, did we not? And the high priest that we have in Jesus Christ. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Of course, it's the law that reveals the need that we have, the need for atonement, the need for forgiveness. And of course, that's what Hebrews 4 points us to, the fulfillment of that need in the high priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness and yet was without sin and therefore could atone for all of our sins that we might be assured of our pardon for his sake and in his love. May God be praised. Let us all pray. Beloved Father in heaven, we thank you for for your word and for your spirit and for the spirit who uses our eyes to see the rich realities of, of your gospel promise to us and the sacraments that you have given to your family, the church, to the bride of the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that it's because we are weak that we need to see these things. When we were little children, we needed things to see, to learn lessons, because of the weakness of our minds. And Lord, because of the slowness of our hearts, we need the sacraments. We thank you, Father, that you have dealt with us according to our need. That you have not mocked us in our weakness. You have not cast us off in our weakness, but you have said, in your weakness I will give you sight. Due to your weakness, I will show you something that you need to see and apprehend. And so, Father, we thank you that, again, we can witness the waters of baptism And know, Lord, that even as we have been washed with this water, when we were baptized, we know, O Lord, by faith that we have been washed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That our problem is that we are unclean. During the week, O Lord, we pick up stains from our workplace and we try and scrub them off. And no matter how hard we try, to scrub them off, we cannot. What a, what a beautiful illustration of sin. That no matter how hard we try to, to make ourselves clean, we cannot make ourselves clean. But what we cannot do, you have done for us in your Son. And so we bless you this day for the promises that you have made that are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. And we thank you, O Lord, that in Jesus Christ you love believers and their children. And so, Father, we thank you for the blessing that you have been to Joel and Sarah Lynn in their relatively short marriage. And you have blessed them already with this child. You have blessed them already, O Lord, to see and know a love that is outside of them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as they live out their sacrificial love for for Alicia Renata and all the other children that you may be pleased in your providence to give them, help them, O Lord, to have the strength and the fortitude to be faithful and diligent. In a world that is becoming increasingly militant against the gospel, in a world that is increasingly unfriendly to the truths of your word and the people who would confess them. And so give them strength. Give them courage. Courage to believe that you are on the throne. 
and you will faithfully bless the means that you have called your people to use to raise up children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Father, we pray that this day you would not only remind Joel and Sarah Lynn of what you have just done, but you would remind each and every one of us of the promise that was made at our baptism by you to us. And that we would hear that profound word of, of application that we heard in the form for baptism. That in every covenant there are two parts. And that we are called to respond to the promise of the covenant by faith. There are some even now that are sinning against the promises that you made many years ago to them. They are drifting from those promises. They are denying those promises. They are rebelling against those promises. They are living fast and loose in light of those promises. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as you do not forget the promises that you have made, that we would not forget the promise that was made. And Lord, that we would in faith and repentance turn from our wicked ways and seek your face while it is yet the day of salvation. And that we would cry out to you, that you would take from our hands the every excuse that we like to, to come up with and announce and proclaim as to why we don't take our faith seriously, why, why we don't really want to be a part of the church, and, 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 and why we don't become more serious about godly things. We can make it sound so good. We can even justify ourselves before man, leaving man to say, oh, I can understand. Lord, help us to understand we can never be justified before you if we are not living for Christ, who is the justifier of our souls. And so, Lord, we thank you that this Lord's Day we have opportunity to come to the waters of baptism. And that next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll have the opportunity to come to the wine and to the bread. To recognize, O oh Lord, that our believing parents have brought us to the baptismal font. But it's living, breathing faith that brings us to the table. So Lord, as you have sent forth your invitation to come to the table, we pray, Lord, that we would come to Jesus and find in Him our all and all. Father, we thank you for the new life that you have given to our congregation, the sprouting life, abundant life. We also pray, O oh Lord, for those that are weak and those that are failing. Our prayers go to Mel Visser at this time, even as our thoughts are for him and for May. In light of what they're going through with the stage four colon cancer that's been diagnosed and and the desire to not treat this. To choose to see this as the means and the vehicle that you're going to use to bring him to yourself. And oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that peace. To know that this is the way that you're going to bring your son home to you. We pray, Father, that that peace would be upon Mel and May upon the Vandermeil family, Heidi. She looks to her grandpa and the children to their, to their great-grandpa. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will cause your face to shine upon them, that in the midst of the experience of the sadness of sorrow, of loss, they would know that they belong to you and that he belongs to you, and that therefore even in this, through their tears and in their sorrow, they can rejoice in the unchanging promises of your grace. We thank you, Lord, that this past Friday, this place was a place of true joy and celebration as Micah and Grace Vandermeulen made vows to you and to each other. We pray, Lord, that you will bless them at the outset of their relationship with each other and that you will keep them as they are off on their honeymoon. Protect them, provide for them, and establish their home on the foundation 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we do pray that you will bless and minister to our every need as we come to hear your word. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. Turn now your Psalter hymnals to Psalter number 175. Psalter number 175. Let's rise to sing the three stanzas, 175. Turn with me now in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We'll begin reading at verse 12 down to the end of verse 18 that's found in your pew Bibles on page 391. 391. 2 Chronicles 7. This is a unique time in the redemptive history of God's people. The temple has been consecrated and dedicated to the glory of In the honor of God, Solomon has just brought his prayer before the Lord. And now the Lord speaks to Solomon in light of this time of dedication, in light of this time of devotion. 2 Chronicles 7, beginning at verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, Or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you. And if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father saying, 
You shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. Thus far. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Let's pray. Beloved Father in heaven, it is our prayer now that as we come to this lesson on prayer, that we would recognize the fulfillment of this passage in the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is the one who has tabernacled among us. That through Him we meet with You. And through Him we have confidence that You will hear our prayers and answer them. Not because we have come into a particular building, but because we speak in the name of the One who is our High Priest. We speak in the name of the one who is the one tabernacling among us. We speak in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so teach us, O God, what it means to be a people of prayer. We ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. I do not uh, always have special sermons in light of baptism. It seems that uh, the baptisms that we have in our congregation normally take place uh, in the midst of some sermon series that I happen to be finding myself in or that we happen to find ourselves in. And while we like to try to to bring that into the particular sermon or how the Lord usually providentially has something to say to us through whatever text it happens to be uh, about baptism, ordinarily we don't have special sermons related to this. Now, In God's providence, we're not in the midst of a sermon series right now. And so we can perhaps pause in a way that we don't always or ordinarily pause and reflect on what it means to raise children and the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, then why didn't you pick a passage that relates to the training of children, the fear and the admonition of the Lord? Because if we're just going to free text this, if we're just going to look at any passage that relates to the raising of children, you could think that you you could find perhaps a a better passage than this. There are, of course, many passages that relate to us the, the practical ways in which we're to raise up our children. There are many passages that we can focus on. You think of Deuteronomy 6 and how we're called to to train up our children and and how we're, when they rise in the morning, when they go to bed in the evening, how we are to surround them in a context that is covenantal. There are many questions that relate to how shall we raise our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And while Scripture, to be sure, is filled with many of these lessons, even after we have looked at these lessons, we're still oftentimes left with questions, if not more questions, than we began with. Am I driving my child away by the way that I'm raising them? Am I taking these points and drawing too hard and fast a line? Am I being too soft? Am I doing things the right way? Am I doing things the wrong way? Maybe I'm doing things the right things, but I'm doing them in a wrong way. You know if you've raised children, if you're raising children, you know that you're constantly plagued with these questions, and even after your children leave your home, you're still asking the questions, aren't you? Because you're still saying, did we do it right? Should we have done things differently? I don't know that we did the right thing. Maybe now that's why they're doing what they're doing. That's why they're going where they're going. And that's what brings us to this passage. That's what brings us to prayer. Raising children unto the Lord makes you feel uniquely weak. And your weaknesses are uniquely exposed when you're raising children. It's very easy for young married couples that don't have children or even have young children to start pontificating about all the great principles that you should be living by, but they know nothing of what it means yet at this point to raise children and how the raising of children uniquely exposes your weaknesses. 
And that's why above all, God has given us through His Son this gift of prayer to fulfill our great vocation within the church, to raise up children in the face of our weakness, to raise them up to fear the Lord. And if there's one thing that you know as parents, you know you need prayer. More than 12 steps to raising some happy, giddy little child. You need prayer. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the, the, the fact that it's funny. When, when I think of me, it's just because we had four boys. I think it also relates to daughters. I think it's probably going to relate to your daughter too. As I think already she's developing into a daddy's girl. And daddy likes to be out in the yard. But one thing you think about when you think of children is, how in the world can they make their knees holy on their pants and we just bought them? There seem to be unique wear patterns to youth. And it's on the knees of little children. I'm like, come on, you got to be ki- I just bought these pants for you and already you've worn holes in them. The unique wear pattern of youth. The uniqueness of youth is you see it oftentimes in their knees. You know where I'm going. If we can use that as a metaphor. What's unique about raising children is that there should be a certain wear pattern for those raising these boys and raising these girls. And that unique wear pattern is seen on our knees as we realize with all of our weaknesses, okay, you've shown me all these principles and I I see these principles, I get these lessons, but now pray. Because that's how you show what it means to be a mom and a dad. Because a son and a daughter, you're going to your father, I don't know how. I mean, yes, God, you've shown me how, but God, I don't know how. I feel like I'm at my wit's end. Teach me. If you don't have the wear pattern on your knees as a parent, well, may the Lord bless you even now and encourage you even now we come to look at this lesson of prayer. And I know that it's unique. And I know that it's uniquely linked to the dedication of the temple. But in this we see something beautiful about the anatomy of prayer and how God would have us to pray and take those those weaknesses that we feel and recognize every single day. And what it means to bow before the Lord our God. Believingly clinging to the promises he makes to us in prayer. And so three things that I want to look at with you this morning. The time of prayer, as the text outlines for us three ways in which the Lord calls us to prayer. And then second of all, the posture in prayer. As we begin at verse 14, look at the three ways in which there is a kind of posture to prayer. And then finally, the commitment to prayer. And there are two, three sub-points from our text. Three ways in which the Lord commits himself to the prayers of his people. But first of all, the time of prayer. And the thing that we recognize from our text is that God is the one who calls us to prayer. God is the one who says it's time to pray. The funny thing is that we don't always like the way God calls us to pray. We don't like the way God says to us necessarily, it's time to pray. I just said there are a number of ways in which the Lord calls us to pray for our children. And and truth be told, we don't always like them because it comes in the context of of problems. It comes to to us in the context of feeling our weakness. And, And we hate to feel like we're weak. We hate to feel like things might be out of control in our lives. But God says, that's the exact thing that I use to bring you to me in prayer. I'm going to use obvious things that you're not able to avoid. Things that are then unavoidable. You can't just go, well, I didn't see that. Well, I didn't recognize that. I didn't feel that. God says, no, I'm going to make it very clear to you. It is time, time to pray. 
We sometimes say, we, well, we don't have time to pray. And how many times have people not said that? I don't have time to pray. I'm busy. I wake up early in the morning. My alarm clock goes off, and, and five is the first number. Four is the first number. And when I finally go to bed at night, after coming home at eight o'clock, I, 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 I'm just, I don't have time. I remember a wise elder that I used to serve with. He said, you don't have time not to pray. So quit saying you don't have time to pray. You don't have time not to pray. The Lord says, now is the time to pray. And look at what he says. He says, verse 13, my time, my call to pray is unavoidable. You cannot ignore it. Because I'm going to shut the heavens. I'm going to command devastation. I'm going to send pestilence. Three ways in which God says, I'm going to call you to prayer from our text. I'm going to shut the heavens. I'm going to command devastation. I'm going to send pestilence. We need to get rid of this notion that God is a God of lollipops. That God is a God of bonbons. That God is a God of just this big, forever, happy smile. and Just this warm, cuddly dude. And that any time something bad happens in our lives, we wonder, well, where are you, God? This isn't the God that I serve. And maybe that's right. It isn't the God that you serve because you're not serving the real God as he defines himself in his word. God says, my providence is only at work when good things happen to you. And everything's right with your checkbook because finally it balanced the providence of the Lord. And and everything's right with you because things are just clicking. And so it's all good. It's all good. Thank you, God. But the moment it turns bad, we go, where is God? God does not only calm the storm. He also, at times, according to his providence, according to his purpose, he, he creates The storm. He creates the storm. God says, I use leaf and blade. I use rain. I use drought. I use fruitful years. I use lean years to do something. We go, well, what are you doing? Why? I'm calling you to pray. You little busybody that says you don't have time to do it. You don't have time to spend with me. Your creator God, the lover of your soul, the redeemer of your life. I'm helping you. If this is help, I don't think I need it. You know, this is help. And you need it. God says, I am the one that calls you to pray. And I use these means to bring you, to summons you to prayer. To open up your eyes to who you are. So that you would not ignore me. But confess me. So three ways that he says that he uses to call us. To pray. To open up our eyes. He says, look around you. Look at what's going on in the business world. Look at what's going on in our culture. Look at what's going on with our weather. Look at what's going on with the government. Look at what's going on in the church. Look at it. Own that I'm sovereign over it. And pray. Look what's going on in your family. Recognize what's going on in your family. Confess that I'm sovereign even over that. And pray. It's time to pray. Second, the posture in prayer. The posture in prayer. And here too we see three things. We saw three ways in which the Lord uses to summons his people to pray, to call his people to pray. It's time to pray. The posture in prayer. We see first of all the posture in prayer is humility. If my people humble themselves. Arrogance is not befitting of a Christian. Because a Christian realizes in so many different ways and has revealed to him in so many different ways that he is weak. We are not strong. Arrogance 
pride. There is no place for it in the Christian life. And it is impossible to come to God in believing prayer and expect to be heard if we come with arrogance, if we come with pride, if we come as Teflon men and women. Everything's deflecting off of us. If my people humble themselves. The posture in prayer, first of all, is humility. But look at what the Lord calls us to be humbled by. Because, right, it comes in the context of the time in which we're being called to pray. So it comes in the context of what? It comes in the context of, of there not being clouds or there being clouds. It comes in the context of there being a lot of rain or very little rain. In this case, very little rain. There aren't a lot of clouds right now. Something as simple as the lack of clouds. The fact that God says, I'm not going to let it rain. Something that we take for granted. We say, well, God's not going to let it rain. Fine, I'll turn on my sprinkler system. And I'll just bump up the percentage a little bit more. I'll flip it up to 110% or 130%. Aha, take that. No rain, I can make it rain myself. And he says, I'm going to really humble you. That there is no bumping up the percentage or flipping on the little rain gauge in your garage that you're going to make it any better. I'm going to humble you with something as mundane as a billowy cloud or the lack thereof. How else is the Lord going to humble his people through locusts, bugs, right? Things that we would take for granted, call them insignificant, right? Big deal. A bug on the outside, the locusts. Or a microscopic bug on the inside that you can't even hardly see, or you can't see, can't see, hope you can't see it, with the naked eye. Something insignificant to humble you. See, the question of the text is this, will you recognize that posture to your life, to your living, to your prayers? If my people humble themselves, recognizing that we have a propensity to arrogance. If my people will humble themselves, if they'll get off the high and mighty ground of the proud and the boastful and humble themselves and say, yes, Lord, you use weak means to reveal how weak I am. Second, be humble Pray and seek my face. I, I, I link those two together. Pray and seek my face. He uses ordinary means for us to look to him. It's one thing, though, to be humbled. It's another thing to take that humility and look to God. And look to God. The temptation here is to, to only look for rain in the forecast. or It's to figure out ways how to get rid of the little critters because they're making a mess of our fields. Or... Or it's to to look for a cure to be found. That's the temptation of the text, to just look at, at natural solutions, resolutions to these natural problems. And God is saying at this point, you don't get it. I'm saying, seek my face. So there's nothing wrong with watching the Weather Channel. There's nothing wrong with buying best pest control. There's nothing wrong with praying for a cure. Nothing wrong with that. But if that's all that there is to life, and you're not taking that humility and seeking the face of God, then you've missed the complete posture that we're called to be in as believers. And so God's saying at this point, just don't, don't, don't be just like the, the, the people that are around you. Go, ugh, we live in crazy times. Man, that's a crazy disease. Oh, these radical kids today. Poor Joel and Sarah Lynn having to raise a little girl in these radically horrible times. May God have, I'm so glad I'm not in your position. I'm glad I raised all my babies. And have a good afternoon with your family. <laughs> That's what people say sometimes. Glad I'm done raising babies. Ug these crazy times. No, more like ug these crazy Christians. 
that don't understand what it is to be a people of prayer and the power of prayer. The fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous avails much. Do we not worship and pray to a God who sits on the throne, who counts the nations as but a drop in the bucket? You know what the problem is? We don't realize that our God laughs. He laughs at the foolishness of men. And this is the God to whom we bring our believing prayers. All seeking is praying, but not all praying is truly seeking. We rush through our prayers, but then we take great time and calculation with our complaints, and it doesn't make sense. This ought not to be. We ought not to be better complainers about current events and the current young people than we are prayers for what's going on in this world in which we're called to shine with the light of God's word. Third, turn from your wicked ways. If my people would humble themselves, if they would pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God uses these natural acts of providence to reveal deeper spiritual issues. He uses his providence as cold water on our faces and says, he says, wake up. Which is to say that prayer is not simply, all right, everyone, fold your hands, close your eyes, it's time to pray. Prayer is our commitment to God that we will act. Prayer is coming before God, our God, and saying, God, we covenant with you, we promise to you, we will act. In light of all that we see, we want to respond. We don't want to be passive. Prayer is not passivity. Prayer is activity. Prayer is saying, God, I see in these things around me, in this world that is around me, I have recognized within my own heart, my own weakness, my own sin, my own need for you to rule over, to rule over my life. Jonathan Edwards in his resolutions said that he resolved every time he was confronted with sin of another person, he would remind himself of three of his own sins so that he would be kept in check. The temptation here is to say, wait a second, we're talking about the clouds and we're talking about bugs and we're talking about pestilence and we're talking about disease. What does this have to do with me? (laughs) What did I do? The Lord says, if you take these things and realize that we are all together called to turn from our our wicked ways, that we see what's going on in the brokenness of the world, brokenness from sin, and we realize there is no greater sinner than the one who's standing before you right now. Then take this call to remember your weakness and turn from your wicked ways. We can be so slow that we need big lessons. And God says, I'm going to put big lessons before you in your family as you raise your children, in the world as you seek to live in this world but not be part of this world. As we live with the antithesis, I'm going to give you all kinds of reminders to humble yourself, to seek my face, Turn from your wicked ways as I call you to a time of prayer. But then finally, we see that God responds with a commitment to this prayer. And here the Lord says, He says three things I will hear, hear, I will forgive, and I will heal the land. So God promises that he will not despise the broken and the contrite heart of those that come to him. I will hear. What a beautiful promise that God speaks to us when we humble our hearts, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways. I will hear. I promise I will listen. No matter who you are, I will listen. 
Sometimes it's interesting in, in homes where you have older children and you have younger children, sometimes the older children will begin to despise the youthfulness of the younger children as though the older children were never younger. You, you realize they're acting the same way you used to act. You, you do get that. No, they don't get that. Why are you letting them act like that? Why are you letting them sound like that? Why can't they be more like us, right? Because they're my children. And I hear the needs of all my children. God says to us this morning, young and old, mature believers, immature believers, if you are broken and contrite, in humility you come to me, you seek my face, you turn from your wicked ways, I commit myself to this principle, I will hear you. I will. I will hear you. What a joy we need to have. As the Lord this morning through worship makes that wall between heaven and earth translucent and we begin to see the joy of, of heaven that awaits us, that we have a Father who hears us and now by faith we're beginning to see the God who's on the throne that hears our prayer. He says, I hear you. I hear you. We cry out from a distance. We're downstairs. Mom! <laughs> And we say, what? Come help me. I hear. God says, I will hear. He says, I will forgive. Second, I will forgive. I commit that my response to confess sin will not be mockery. If you come to me and have exposed before me the weakness of yourself, Will not laugh. Recently, I had to go to a doctor. I'll spare you all the gory details because this could get a little iffy as I tell this illustration. But, but I was at the doctor. There was a nurse there. And he said, well, you're going to have to take off your shirt. At which point I said, I'm not taking off my shirt in front of you two. It's never a comfortable thing to be exposed. And by nature, despite what you see when you go to the beach, by nature we have a desire, don't we? To be covered. Ever since the fall, God made us as a result of the fall with natures that have this need to be covered. With a desire that we say, I don't want to be exposed. I don't want people to see me. And God says at this point, first of all, when I say I will forgive you, know this, I am not laughing at what I see. I will not mock you for the weakness that you have. And we're not just talking about flab on the sides of our bodies now. We're talking about the sins of our souls. He says, I will not laugh. But second of all, he says, I will satisfy the desire that I gave you in the fall, that need to be covered, the, the longing to want to be covered. I'll satisfy that. I will forgive. Here they are dedicating this temple. And God says, what? It's through this temple that I will point you to the way in which I will cover you. And that's what we saw this morning, the water. We come here with a need to be covered. Because we're all exposed. And God says, here's the covering that you've been longing for. The covering that in shadow form the temple pointed to. This house of sacrifice, it pointed to. It pointed to the greater lamb. The covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you humble your hearts, you seek my face, you turn from your wicked ways, I promise I will heal. Here, I will forgive. 
will cover. And he says, lastly, I will heal the land. Now when you look at it, that looks relatively mundane. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot we're talking about the healing of the land. We began with the problems in the land. and We're, we're ending with the, the healing of the land. You almost go, wow, this is so profound that you, great God creator, would hear me and that you would forgive me and then introduced to something as mundane as the healing of the land. It almost seems superfluous now. I don't know that I really even care about the land because you love me. But the Lord says, no, I'll heal the land. Because I will take care of even those things. The simple things. Yes, simple. This is simple to God. If God can forgive us of our sins, then it's simple for him to heal the land. If God can forgive our sins, it's a simple thing to say to the paralytic, stand up and walk. If God can forgive us of our sins, he says, I'll heal the land. Because because God's point was never one to punish the land. The land didn't do anything wrong in the first place. But the point was to wake up as people. I will heal the land and take care of all of your needs. The profound ones. The spiritual ones. But also the material ones. I'll provide for you materially as well. And I will heal the land. This morning God has called us to prayer. It's calling you, wordings, to prayer. Very evident way. It's calling you to pray. It's calling us to pray. All we have to do is look around. He's saying all around us, pray. Interesting, this uh, week, talking with some couples, we're talking about, well, if you were to do things differently, what would you do with your children, and raising your children? We just happen to be talking about this. I don't know, maybe we do this differently. Maybe we wouldn't be so finicky on this point. Maybe we'd be a lot more finicky on, on that point. If you were to do it all over again, what would you do differently? And it seems like inevitably that's what we're looking for. We're looking for some practical answer to maybe what is a practical question. And I, I don't mean to, to make it sound as though we can't answer these with practical solutions. But, but as I think about it anyway, to do it over and I'm not as though it's over in, in my life at all. Pray. Come to God. Show the wear patterns of a parent and the face of the wear patterns of your young children. Be committed to praying to the God who says, come boldly. Before the throne of grace, have I not given you a sympathetic high priest who is tempted in every way, yet was without sin? Joel, Sarah Lynn, be committed to prayer. You're at the very beginning. Be committed to praying. To praying. Congregation, if you haven't been committed to praying, be committed to praying. If you need to repent, great news. God says all you have to do is turn from your wicked ways and come to him. And he will hear, he will forgive, and he will heal. What would you do differently? Pray. We'll come then to the God who hears prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for what is the gift of prayer, what is the tool of prayer. This is a tool. This is more than a tool. This is a weapon. And it's more than a weapon. This is, this is the very life breath of, of believing faith. It's the way in which we close our eyes and leave, as it were, the earth behind and come into your very throne room of grace and pray, Father, that you will bless us in our responsibilities as prophets, priests, and kings, as moms and dads, as grandmas and grandpas, as aunts and uncles. Father, we pray and ask that you will use this, your word, to show us what it is to be a praying people. Some of us spend very little time on our knees because we say time is so very, very precious. It is. Therefore, Lord, help us to understand that we don't have time not to pray. 
Father, we pray that you will bless us as a congregation. That we would bathe everything that we do in prayer. That we would consecrate it in prayer. And recognize, O oh Lord, that unless and until we seek your face in prayer, your blessings will not flow. And so, our Lord and our God, we thank you that you have covenanted yourself. You have made promises to your people that you will hear our prayers. You will forgive our sins. And you will take care of our daily needs and wants. So thank you, Father, for this important lesson. And now, Lord, as we go and seek to live this Christian life, May you receive all of the praise, world without end, for Christ's sake. Amen. Psalter number 105 is our song of response. Psalter number 105, let's rise to sing stances 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, 4 of 105. Our doxology is from hymn number 488, both stanzas it's found in your bulletins. Receive now the blessing of the Lord as we part. May the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for another broadcast from the Bethel United Reformed Church. It's our privilege to bring these services to you each week as we seek to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about us here at Bethel, we'd love to hear from you and introduce ourselves to you. You can join us for Sunday worship at 9.30 a.m. or 5.20 p.m. Or you can read more about us on our website at jenisonbethel.org. 
We trust that the Lord has fed you with his word in this day. May you now, therefore, go in his peace until he brings us together again.